Today we uh, kick off a new series uh, with our uh, global debriefing uh, series. This person is joining us all the way from the country of Australia, also the Commonwealth of Great Britain. Let's welcome uh, none other than the uh, host of the Selling Secrets podcast, Josh Gay, and you also know him as 007 AUS. Josh, thank you for joining me on Global James Bond Day and also kicking off the Global Debriefing Series. G'day, Brian. Thank you for having me. Very cool to be here and uh, honored to be the uh, the very first person as a part of this series on, yeah, Global James Bond Day. It's crazy. Oh, I know. And especially, uh, you know, it's just on the brink of the U.S. release of No Time to Die. And unfortunately, you guys still have to wait a little longer. So is this the part where I go? <laughs> just kidding with you, man. I love you. Sticks up the middle finger. Oh, perfect. <laughs> perfect way to totally uh, uh, come back with that. So anyways, how's things uh, going down in Australia during uh, during this uh, tough time, I should say? And I, I my thoughts and uh, prayers uh, go out to all you guys in Australia suffering during this uh, time. Thanks, man. Yeah, look, things things could be better. That's for sure. Obviously, the uh, the pandemic makes life challenging. I personally, I live in uh, Victoria, which is in one of the southern states here. Um, well, is the southern state, I should say. Um, so we've been in lockdown because of the pandemic for the better part of over 260 days now. Um, so, you know, we've been more or less bar a couple of months here or there stuck at home, not able to sort of leave a five kilometer radius of where we live, which is uh, it's a couple of miles when you convert it. I'm not very good with the, the whole imperial to metric. <laughs> Don't ask me either because neither am I. So that's a win win right there. Definitely. Um, yeah, look, it, it, it is what it is. Um, thankfully, the, the vaccine rollout is finally picking up a bit here, which is good. Um, and yeah, things, things are looking up. Unfortunately, as you said, we're, um, we've got a little while still to wait for the new Bond film uh, for No Time to Die. We're getting that released um, on the 11th of November. Um, so that will be six years to the day that Spectre was released, that that comes out here. So a bit of a kick in the guts, uh, obviously, with the guys in the UK and Europe getting it already and the US seeing everyone getting excited for that. Um, but we'll get there. Um, it's a really good Bond community down here and very tight knit. So we look out for each other. and Yeah, it's good. Well, and that's a good thing. You guys are rallying behind each other, which is very key, and especially during this pandemic. and in time of need uh just like the people here in the u.s they're rallying behind each other and of course you know the people in the uk are doing the same thing i would assume wherever we have people at they're all rallying behind each other exactly so that's what matters exactly. the most so 007 lots to be done are you ready to get back to work so you launched the Selling Secrets podcast, uh, which you minorly, minorly had a uh, speed bump uh, by having uh, computer issues. What can we expect from your podcast and what makes it different from all the other James Bond podcasts out there in today's uh, pandemic uh, life? Absolutely. So, yeah, I launched the uh, Selling Secrets podcast a couple of months ago now. Um, basically, the podcast is about not only James Bond, whilst obviously I'm a massive James Bond nerd, uh, it covers action films and spy films across the entire genre. And what makes it different is um, I personally, I work in the advertising industry. So we're looking behind the scenes a little bit more of some of the marketing campaigns and how the films are actually, uh, you know, put out to the world and how they sell the film in the lead up to the film as well as some of the behind the scenes making of. So um, there's not a lot of podcasts out there that necessarily talk about uh, things outside of the trailer. So we go in depth with uh, marketing plans um, all the way through to post-release merchandising um, to try and you know, delve a little bit deeper into what makes you know, the, the hype around the films that we love so much special and 
how, uh, yeah, how the advertising industry and the uh, marketing teams uh, lead into them. So let me ask you this, uh, since you brought up the uh, marketing aspect of your podcast, and that's your main focus, do mm. you think the marketing brands of the past James Bond fan, uh, film, I not fil fans, I meant films, uh, do you think the past uh, marketing uh, used in the films, uh, they're uh, outdated, uh, per se? <laughs> um, look, so I grew up in the Brosnan era, you know, my first Bond film was GoldenEye, first cinema Bond film was uh, Die Another Day. And looking back over I, the, especially the Brosnan era, um, one of the things that they did incredibly well was the marketing behind each of his films. Say what you will about Die Another Day, but that had one hell of a marketing uh, push behind it. You had everything from video games to toys, um, as well as all the sartorial aspects and a lot of product placement in that film as well. I think the Craig era, um, they have definitely gone for more of a luxury lifestyle aspect. And it has, I guess, become a bit more of a niche compared to what they were previously um, and very much aimed at a bit more of an older, more affluent audience. Um, there's not as much in the way of uh, brand um, partnerships with the Craig films that, you know, is accessible to wider audiences. Um, when you look at things like Star Wars um, or it, the Marvel films, for instance, they've done an incredible job of really diversifying what they do in terms of how they sell their films from, uh, yeah, tie-ins with things like uh, Fortnite all the way through to that. So, um the, the Bond films are incredible at what they do and their, their tie-ins with you know, brands like Aston Martin and so forth are the best of the best, but there's a lot of room for improvement, I'd say. Yeah, I was going to say, I think No Time to Die has probably been the most heavy, heaviest, uh, or heaviest, I should say. I'm just not speaking clearly today. <laughs> Don't know if it's just because I'm on the verge of being so excited of finally seeing the new Bond film. Or if it's just one of those days. But I, I will say this. I think my No Time to Die feels like it's been the most heaviest marketed film since probably Die Another Day. And I don't know if it's just because that was the 40th and we're on the brink of the 60th and we're not going to have a new Bond film for a while. Or what, but... I will say, No Time to Die really does feel like it's pushed the bar pretty high. And I would say, honestly, out of the marketing campaign for it all, my favorite is probably uh, for Thunderball. Really? Like, you know, they got Gilbert Toys involved. They got, yep. uh, they did the 007 Vodka. They did 007 swim trunks. They just, it was bombastic uh, back in the 60s and they just made it their own brand. Mm, Bond mania back then oh, was absolutely. massive. Um, personally, I think, yeah, No Time to Die, as you said, they've had a lot more time compared to the previous Bond films in the Craig fil uh, tenure um, to obviously market it because of all of the uh, the pushbacks on the film. Uh, the delays um i th personally i think skyfall they did it the best i think that was one of the most incredible uh film marketing campaigns ever done um and that was what my first episode of selling secrets covered quite in a lot of detail um i felt that skyfall just absolutely the way they did that was a, a master class in film promotion and marketing and as a result it was a, a billion dollar film Absolutely. It's insane that that was the case, though, for that film. Absolutely. This is going to be a favorite topic of yours. I, I know you've been anxiously uh, wanting to talk No Time to Die with somebody, and I know you wanted to talk about it with uh, me uh, uh, for quite a while. So let's jump into it, I think. Absolutely. So, so not, No Time to Die has been delayed again in Australia. What are what do you expect from... Uh, it now uh, being uh, delayed six years since Spectre. Um, yeah, it's it's been a long time waiting for No Time to Die. I'm 
cautiously optimistic, very excited for the film. Obviously, it's had a bit of a, a rocky production history, what with uh, Danny Boyle leaving and Kerry Fukunaga coming on. Um, but I'm I'm very excited for the film from what I've heard from everyone who's seen it already. Um, it has been a bit divisive with the fan base, but God, it's looking like it's going to be one of the, the most fun, especially in Daniel Craig's films. Um, man, I'm just excited. <laughs> oh, I, I, I agree. I'm like, you know, I, I hear like from true people that have actually read Fleming's uh, work and then the people that have are just the fans of the movies. I'm hearing from both standpoints. If you have read of the Fleming novels and if you re uh, enjoy the movies to an extreme like myself, I've only read, of course, Casino Royale and Live and Let Die. But uh, I, I'm a diehard, I should say, film historian of the franchise. Uh, you're going to go in and actually love the film. Yeah. It was and truly I'm, I'm... a great way to wrap up Craig's tenure. Yeah. If you only just like the films, you may be disappointed of how the film is. I, I've heard so many mixed things, but I've heard also if you've seen it multiple times, and if you didn't like it the first time, it is growing on people more and more too. Yeah. So I think that, it's definitely I, a that is what really is helping out, I think, uh, the case. And I know I will probably only have the chance of seeing it once. So I'm going in with myself and I'll be honest and I'm not in your situation of course in Australia but I'm going in with high expectations and mm -hmm. I don't know if you are as well and especially you know we've had Casino that was a hit Quantum was a bust Skyfall was a hit <laughs> Spectre was a bust and now here we are six years later all right or has it been yeah it's, yeah it's been six years it'll be six years for you but you know yeah um i'm putting that in the counter in my uh saying right now but we better hope that no time to die uh delivers and from what i've seen to this very day it's on track of doing something special from what they've said and it's hit like 113 million uh, internationally, which, oh my gosh, I can't believe, because that's, that's on track of uh, Skyfall numbers from what they were saying. Hmm. Well, it's already beating out Spectre, so, oh. I mean, and that, that that's what, I, when you say, what do you expect from the film, and what do you want from the film, as long as it's better than Spectre, that's well, all Well, as long about. as it's better than Spectre, and as long as it's better than Quantum, too, so <laughs> that's how I'm looking at I'm a quantum apologist. So. Oh, are, are you now? <laughs> yeah, look, it, quantum, I, I enjoy more than Spectre. Um, I'm yeah. the opposite, actually. There you go. So, and, and you said, hey, you thought we had a lot in common? No, I actually <laughs> uh, like uh, Spectre a lot better. Shoot me now, people. I, I, I will say this. Is it when it, I, I do not like the Foster Brother uh, aspect. Hashtag spoiler alert. Uh, I do not like that. I really do not. That is the one thing that they screwed up. Uh, the soundtrack, I do not like either. But I do like uh, the direction that they did go with it. You know, uh, if they didn't announce that, you know, Blofeld, Oberhauser was not Bond Step Brother, I thought it would have been a perfect film. And I have multiple leaked scripts, which I don't know if I should be saying that during this right now. Uh, yeah, that's all I'm going to say. So, but, you know, I think the film is growing on me and I'm hoping it'll grow on me even more once I see No Time to Die. And maybe yeah. it'll be the same thing for you. Maybe it'll grow I, on you. I think No Time to Die will definitely improve my opinion of Spectre. So, uh, with uh daniel officially uh hanging up his ppk and being done with the role who's your ideal uh replacement and which way do you think the franchise should go from here yeah so th this is something that i've been doing on my instagram channel at 007 oz where we've been doing recastings with modern actors of the previous uh bond films so okay. 
I've gone through and found about 25 plus. We also did a, a recasting of um, Never Say Never Again with uh, Pierce Brosnan coming back. <laughs> interesting. Very yeah. interesting. I wanted to give him a proper send off, you know? Um, so what, what I'm hoping from the, the new actor and what I expect from the new actor, at least currently they'll be in their early thirties. Um, if they're working off the current production schedule, I'm not expecting them to announce the new actor until next year, maybe the year after. I'm hoping for the the big 60 that they announce the new actor, but, and, you know, Barbara and Michael have both said that they're not even starting the search. Obviously they're producers, so they probably have people in mind, um, but they're not starting the search till next year. So realistically, we won't get the new film until 2024 maybe 2025 so by then that actor who's in their early 30s will be in their mid 30s and be able to carry the franchise uh for a bit longer because obviously daniel you know he was 38 uh when casino came out um he was supposed to be the young guy who was going to carry the franchise and be the longest running um but with the mgm bankruptcy and all that sort of stuff that wasn't to be so by having someone a little bit younger than Daniel, I think they'll be able to to run it that bit more. Oh, I, um, I, no, I, I agree. I, I will tell you this. Can I actually share you my actually a little brainstormed idea that I've been uh, putting down like pen to paper and like, you know, I, I, I've been talking with uh, Tim Guccione of no time to bond podcast actually about it. And like, you know, out and, but I've came up with uh, an idea. What if uh, the franchise went the direction of like the beginning of Doctor No, but don't don't start it with Doctor No. No, uh, if you remember correctly, uh, Connery and uh, Bernard Lee uh, were uh, talking in his office, and Bernard Lee uh, delivers the line, of course, about the. Uh, Beretta that he was using and it jamming on his last job. Mm. What if they did something like that where, you know, give him the Beretta to start off with, make it jam on him and him spending a few months in hospital and then he has to re earn his double O or and uh, you then send him off on a uh, proper mission. That's it. Give me a gun. Yes, I thought so. This damn Beretta again. I've told you about this before. You tell him. For the last time. Nice and light. In a lady's handbag. No stopping power. Any comment, 007? I disagree, sir. I've used the Beretta for ten years. I've never missed with a jet. Yeah, maybe not. But it jammed on your last job and you spent six months in hospital in consequence. If you carry a double O number, it means you're licensed to kill, not get killed. And another thing, since I've been head of MI7, there's been a 40% drop in double O operative casualties, and I want it to stay that way. You'll carry the water. Unless, of course, you prefer to go back to standard intelligence duties. No, sir. I would not. Then from now on, you carry a different gun. Show him, Amra. Walter PPK. 7.65 mil with a delivery like a brick through a plate glass window. Takes a Brouch silencer with very little reduction in muzzle velocity. The American CIA swear by them. Thank you, Major Blue Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Any questions, 007? No, sir. All right, then. Best of luck. Thank you, sir. Double O seven. Sir? Just leave the Beretta. Uh, have you read the Anthony Horowitz novels? I actually have not. I've, Like I said, I've only read Casino. And yep. I uh, again, Casino Royale, when that came out, and of course, you know, even reading it to this current date, you go back into time. I feel like you can s smell the cigarette smoke uh, in the uh, non-ventilated uh, casinos back in the day. And, <laughs> It's just a time capsule when you hop in and read that book. Well, I, I read the uh, audio or listen to the audio because that's the only way I can truly pick up a yeah. form of book these days, unfortunately. And it's the only way I can potentially actually 
I think, ex like hold in the stuff into my brain long term. So, you and me both, um, with the the bond reading challenge or Fleming reading challenge, I should say, that David uh, from the Bond Experience has been doing. Um, I've been listening to all the audiobooks. So I subscribe to Audible, and those are those audiobooks that are narrated by the various actors are phenomenal. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, what I, what I was saying about um, Horowitz Forever and a Day, yeah. um, which was the second one that he wrote, it's a bit of a prequel to Casino Royale. Okay. Um, so it's set back in back in time before Casino, the literary version, and um, it's how he becomes, you know, 007. Um, you know, he how he chooses the the number, all that sort of stuff, and how he sort of comes to be James Bond as such prior to casino um i reckon that would be a, a really cool adaptation it's a again it's got quite a, a deep emotional core but it's also got a, a really cool villain and a lot of mystery around it i reckon that could be a, a neat one to go after so you think maybe potentially uh doing horowitz uh why am i drawing blank uh well you can't do the benson uh, novels because uh ray uh, benson's uh, novels have been used uh already mm. uh in the world is not enough and tomorrow never dies uh i'm trying to think of what who did trigger mortis i can't remember now but it's horowitz, horowitz as well, well. Yeah. uh carte John blanche Gardner, jeffrey diva yeah they could well and yeah. they could go that route i think absolutely know, to continue on the franchise if they wanted to but we will find out it, it'll be <laughs> one of the biggest mysteries uh leading up uh as years go on and uh whoever's craig uh Whoever is Craig's uh, replacement, will they uh, actually call up Daniel and say, hey, do you still want to produce with us? Do you want to weigh your... I, I I would actually, and I would welcome that if uh, they said, hey, Daniel, do you want to come on and be a producer full time with us? That's just me. Again, I, I'm speaking. Yeah. From, I'm speaking from that. Well, I know Barbara's got a lot of respect for Daniel. Um, oh, well, and that clearly, be... we all know clearly. that. <laughs> um, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if that happens, if he has a bit of a hand in choosing his replacement. Obviously, uh, Michael G. Wilson, he's God, he's pushing his 80s, I think. And uh, I think he's 80. I think he's 86. I don't want to. I don't IMDB things. Uh... Yeah while i do these these are completely raw if this is the very first one that you're listening to so i don't uh imdb i don't do any google search or anything i'm just speaking from my mind and what i think and if i don't remember i say honestly i'm drawing a blank so yeah yeah um but yeah to have someone younger i say younger daniel's in his 50s but to be able to carry on the um the mantle of them, I think would be cool if they don't necessarily keep it in the family, keep it in the broccoli family. I know um, Greg Wilson, um, Michael's son has been involved, but I think having Daniel on board to, to carry the torch would be very cool. Okay. So while we're on the topic of, again, Daniel being officially done, mm -hmm. I'm going to hand you over. Let, let's do a little scenario here. I'm going to give you over the keys you're going to be uh uh you're going to be the casting director. Yep. Okay. I'm going to give you some roles in this uh uh future uh, Bond film that we're getting. Tell me who you want and just speak right off your top of your mind. Absolutely. My name's Bond. James Bond. Max Irons. Okay, give me a reason yep. why, please. So Max is the son of Jeremy Irons, so young British actor. He's in his 30s at the minute. Um, he's in a TV series, uh, American spy series called Condor. Um, it's an adaptation of the novel Six Days of the Condor and the 1970s film with Robert Redford, The Three Days of the Condor. Um, so it's a, a spy, spy thriller where he plays a CIA analyst who's uh, framed for the murder of his colleagues and has to go on the run and uncovers this conspiracy uh, within the CIA. Um, in that series, and especially series two, where he plays a bit more of a damaged 
character and he's a bit more of a traditional spy sort of character. I see a lot of Fleming in that, you know, he's hard smoking, hard drinking, shuts himself off emotionally and he plays that character incredibly well. Um, and to me, that was just his audition to be Bond. Um, and if he doesn't at least get, um, you know, the chance to audition, I think they'll be really, really missing out. You know, he's the perfect age right now. Mm. Incredibly good looking guy and a very talented actor. Um, yeah. He... You had no authority. None. Oh, all right. So uh, M, um, there's a, a couple of options. If we were to go back to a, a female M, I think I'd love to see Charlotte Rampling take okay. a go um obviously she's an incredible british actress she's a little bit older now though so might not be able to carry the the torch there but i, I, I was gonna say to olivia coleman that. olivia coleman would be another one i mean her in Broadchurch, she's phenomenal absolutely I'd, I'd love to see her in that so um definitely i think I, i'd like to see them go back to that more judy dench style of them whilst i've loved ray fines um I think having that sort of more motherly figure for Bond, especially in sort of this day and age, has really, really given it something. It's a device different. world that we're living in too. Mm. And don't get me wrong, I love Rafe. Rafe is probably the best M since uh, Bernard Lee, and I might get shot for that. Please don't shoot me. But um, but I truly think that. Um, so. Ah, oh, Miss Moneypenny. Good morning, Moneypenny. Good morning, sir. Money Penny. Um, I had a couple of actresses who I listed down. Um, probably the one who I'd like to see the most would be Freema Agamon. Um, she was in Doctor Who series three and series four, I think it was, alongside David Tennant. Um, she's a um, smaller British actress who's, you know, had her time, um, you know, on TV, but I think she'd be... Uh, phenomenal in the role and also would be um you know someone who would bounce off bond as a character um i'm just going through sort of the list that i had here just trying to figure out who else that i had listed down um uh, yeah i think she'd probably be my main one for, for my penny ah oh, 007 q please excuse the mess everything's a little bit up in the air but with the changes and all a couple of things to get through q Q, 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 Q. I think someone like uh, Richard Ayoade would be phenomenal. Um, if you've seen the IT crowd, he plays Maurice Moss, the very nerdy character um, who's just socially awkward, um, doesn't quite know how to interact with people. Um, and you see that in him as just a normal person anyway. He's a very quirky guy. Um, I think he'd just be phenomenal. He'd bring a bit more comedy back to the role. Um, so a pretty much a, a another Ben Wishaw type. Kind of, but I think a little bit more off the wall. He's a bit more, he can be a bit more blunt than Ben Wishaw as well. Like he's young, but he's um, a bit more aloof than Ben Wishaw. Um, okay. I think I could see him really rolling with that um, and doing something fun. Morning, 007. Good morning, Tanner. He'll see you now. And then in terms of Bill Tanner, um, I did have him down when I did my Casino Royale casting because I couldn't figure out who I wanted to have in the role um, of some of the MI6 regulars in Casino. Um, I think Matthew McFadden would be really cool in the Bill Tanner role. Um, okay. I'd like them to use him a little bit more whilst Rory Kinnear has been really good in the role i think he's been underutilized and not necessarily written very well um obviously in the novels he's bond's best friend in yeah. mi6 so um someone like matthew mcfadden who's been in the the uh, bbc what is it the bbc in the the english spy series spooks uh, back in the early 2000s um, he's also in i think it's a tv show called succession at the minute as well um, he's a, a very well-established character actor, and I think he'd do really well. Funny game, right? Sorry, I should have introduced myself, seeing as we're related. 
Felix Leiter. And I'm going to start off with this one because you know, I, I'm the American out of the two of us. Uh, but I've always said if you're going to recast Felix, and I, I know he's a big name now, but how about John Hamm? Yes. Yeah, I, I could see that. I love him. I, I love John Hamm. He's sharp dressed. He yep. fits the build. He's played a spy on uh, Mad Men. He... He knows how, like I said, he's a sharp dressed man. He, he, mm. yeah, he hits the, he hits the mold in the breed of a, like a secret agent, CIA agent, whatever, however you want to word it. But he hits that so well. And, and Mad Men proved it. Hmm. Um, yeah. He, God, he could have been Bond. If he could put on a British accent, hell, he right. could have been a good Bond. Well, so could um, I, but. <laughs> um uh, matthew mcconaughey really fleming. yeah you, you look at how fleming well described... then you, i hate to say this yeah so here's a man from texas and then you got <laughs> matthew mcconaughey uh with uh that little sharp texas accent now then I, I would say he would have to need a lot of voiceover work yeah but you look at the way um fleming wrote him he's you know blonde haired sandy haired um you know blue eyed texan drawl all that sort of stuff i reckon that is true you, yeah you, you did uh hit that on the nail on the coffin right there i no yeah I, i'm i'm throwing my hands up in the air uh <laughs> yeah I, i'm not gonna do it right now but uh yeah you i'm throwing my hands up in there hashtag my drop you just uh nailed in the coffin uh, with that i give it to you thank you so all right, so we're going to jump right back into actually No Time to Die and wrap it on that last little question about No Time to Die, of course. What don't you want to see uh, from the film? That's a good question. Um, I've been racking my brains about this for a while now. Um, I'm in two minds. Do I want them to tie it up with maybe the death of James Bond? Because I don't see how they could how they could continue on after Daniel Craig being such a circular and insular um, narrative arc for his films. So maybe if they were to go down the route of what they did in The Dark Knight Rises, where um, you know, Bruce Wayne sacrifices himself to to save Gotham with the nuclear bomb, um, but have it that little bit um, ambiguous potentially. Um, you know, did he? Didn't he? Does he get to go and live his life with Madeline afterwards? Obviously, I don't know what the hell goes in the, on in the film. Um, Neither so this, do this I. Is all <laughs> speculation for me. Um, I I could I could see that. But at the same time, do I want to see my childhood hero die? No, I don't. So I'm, I, I like, I'm, I'm grappling with that, and I, I don't think I want to see them kill James Bond. I think that's really going to be a bit of a gut punch for a lot of fans. Um, the other thing I don't want to see is more of the bloody brother story uh, we touched on this already the stepbrothers um austin powers daddy wasn't there all that sort of stuff um just give me blofeld give me a maniacal super villain don't even tell me he's his brother again because that was just awful i'm not opposed to that either of kim killing off james bond I think it's actually the, probably the perfect way to end uh, Craig's uh, Bond. I'm sorry, and people yeah. may hate me for it, but I truly think uh, that's probably the best way to do it. Or have it be a Majesty's like situation and kill off Madeline, and if, if that is if she does make it throughout the film. Uh, yeah. Again, I haven't seen the film. Um, and I've been staying well uh, away from spoilers uh, oh, as well. So, so like, I, yeah, try, it, this is hard. probably the most hardest I've had with any Bond film, to be frankly honest. Because I remember when Spectre came out. Of course, I wasn't making content back then or anything like that. I was actually reading spoilers, spoilers, spoilers to see it what Christoph Waltz's character came out to be. 
I was really hoping he was going to be Blofeld. And did I sniff it out? I sniffed it out. <laughs> I was... Uh, there was so many things I was trying to sniff out uh, throughout that whole entire film, and you would not believe. I wish I could have recorded my reaction of trying to sniff out spoilers, but I'm not going to go back six years. Yeah. We're different people than we yeah. were six years, right? But yeah, yeah, if now that I'm making content, I don't want to know what happens in the film. I don't. Yeah. I well, you really don't. Want your I went on a freaking social media shutdown for four days uh, by deleting my apps on my phone, and then out of the blue, I was like, "Oh, someone told me it's like, dude, nobody's really posting." That's spoilers. Yeah. This is the first but, time people are actually keeping hush hush about a Bond film. Well, there's the big no time for spoilers push, um, and I think a lot within the bond community itself i think everyone's been very respectful there's been a couple of accounts who've posted spoilers or have you know put things in comments or you know posted certain photos and i've just gone unfollow unfollow thankfully i'm basically blind without my glasses so um so well a, don't some don't take yeah. them off then man then uh, <laughs> uh you better uh, keep them on yeah um but someone posted you know the screenplay Oh, it was the, the final page of oh. a leaked screenplay. Um, well, I know, yeah. I, I know James Page over at MI6 and a few of uh, them. They did post the spoilers uh, last year, like they yeah. and they did warn people that this does contain spoilers. I will say this: I did read them. Do I remember to this current day on October fifth, twenty twenty one? Do I remember? Probably Absolutely not. not. <laughs> so I think that tells you something. Absolutely. And look, to to be honest, yeah, everyone's been really respectful, especially for us Aussies who've got over a month still um, to wait for the film. Um, and I mean, again, I'm, my heart breaks yeah. for you guys. It's not fair. I'm sorry. I, I can't say what the prime minister will do once November comes if we're going to eventually say, hey, it's going out the Blu-ray DVD streaming service, and who knows, you guys may still be waiting to see it in theaters because then pretty much everywhere else in the globe has seen it. Like China's gotten yeah. it already. Korea, India, Everywhere. US. Everywhere's gotten it besides Australia. And that's honestly going to break my heart even more, the fact that you guys have, are still waiting to see it in theaters. Like it's... and they, our neighbors in New Zealand get it, yeah. Before we do. <laughs> oh, I was gonna say, no, they're gonna send a uh, a release uh, to uh, Martin Campbell. I I don't know if he's even <laughs> residing in New Zealand still to this current day, or if he's stateside or located somewhere else. But no, they're just gonna send Martin Campbell since you know he's a native of New Zealand. And same with oh. Lee Tamahori, he's oh. a Kiwi as well. Well, I say this: Lee Tamahori doesn't deserve it, so. He can stay in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, so what influenced you to start your uh, podcast and actual Instagram account? Uh, and going back to, it's called Selling Secrets, and you're known as 007 Oz, which you like to pronounce it as. I, I call it w, 007 AUS just because it's going to be e easier for people to actually search for you, which I will post uh Links down below uh, and the down under uh, section. Uh, so, yeah, what what influenced you to start uh, your podcast and your Instagram account? And why uh, now during the pandemic? Uh, why not uh, prior? Yeah, look, it, it's been one of those things that I've always wanted to do. Um, I'll start with the Instagram account because that's, I guess, what came before the podcast. Um I've followed guys like David Zeritsky, Calvin Dyson, Joe Darlington for many years. And I've always wanted to do a YouTube channel of some sort. And in my background, I used to work in the film industry uh, prior to advertising. Um, so I was a, a cinematographer and an editor and you know, did a lot of work in uh, both TV, TVC sort of work. Um, so I was very, very creative and hands-on in, in that industry. And unfortunately, it had a spinal injury and uh, 
ended up having to change careers um, and went back to university and uh, yeah, studied uh, marketing and uh, postgraduate um, and sort of found a passion where I could combine the creative side of things that I've been working on as well as the, you know, the selling things that I'd been working on in the retail industry that I'd sort of been working in uh, to bridge the gap. Um, so that really, yeah, that was something that really inspired me to do it because watching someone like David, who's always talking about the, the sartorial aspects and the products of the film, all that, all those sort of things were really cool seeing someone like Kelvin talk about the movies, the games. Um, I wanted to do something similar to that. I just don't have the time to make a YouTube channel. There's a lot of work that goes into that. And I, I tip my hat off to those guys who are able to put out regular content at such high quality um, because I know how much work that they put into that. So I thought, well, the, the next best thing would be to do an Instagram account. Um, and I wanted it to be different to a lot of other accounts. You know, I'm very good friends with James Roberts, who does um, the James Bond Down Under account. I live very close uh, to the guys from uh, James Bond AU, um, you know, a number of different people. Um, and a lot of their accounts, whilst they're phenomenal and they've got you know, tens of thousands more followers than I do, um, they're, they're very much like fan accounts, um, which is cool. Like they, you know, they they've got a lot of followers and a lot of content that they're very passionate about putting out. And I I just wanted to do something a little bit different that would allow me to still scratch the creative itch. Um, so yeah, as I said before, I've been putting out you know recasting the series rather than just photos from press releases or screenshots from the films because well, and I can appreciate yeah. you doing that because you're keeping it original. Yeah, and, and originality is key, I think, uh, during while you're making content. Uh, it's fun. It's I, I hate to say this, I'm not all about seeing press photos. Guess what? I can go on Google and find those. I can go to Thunderballs.com. I think that's the site. I can see those. I can watch the behind the scenes stuff. I want to see original content, and that's what I thrives me the most and enjoys the most when i see you're making stuff oh, thanks man. i appreciate it um and yeah like uh, you can go to the the 007 instagram account and see all that sort of stuff or go to 007.com if you really want to seek that stuff out um so yeah that that's really what inspired me to do it and i guess the reason i hadn't done it before is you know i do suffer with a bit of anxiety depression where it was like is the stuff that I'm going to put out good enough? Um, so it was always sort of nervous to put it out and start creating and put out my passion there because I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this term over in the States, but here in Australia, we have something called tall poppy syndrome. And no, I'm not. Please elaborate. So tall poppy syndrome is basically where um, someone who's successful, um, we don't like to share in their success. We tend to try and cut them down so if the if the flower grows too tall and too you know too extravagantly we try to cut them down and bring them back to size and that's um, an unfortunate part of Australian culture because we try to be humble and the underdog um, so to sort of you know try and be successful or try and put yourself out there is a bit harder for us just as a, a cultural thing here um, so that was one of the reasons why I hadn't done it and just also the pandemic came around sitting at home whilst, you know, I've been fortunate in the, the fact that I haven't lost my job during the past nearly two years. Now I've, I've had consistent work. I have been sitting at home and bored out of my skull. Yeah. <laughs> so to, um, to have some, a creative outlet um, has been something that has really helped, you know, keep the mental health up and keep, you know, the spirits up during a, a very tough time. So let's uh, let's actually talk about your spinal injury and uh, oh, let's talk about the mental health stuff. I'm all and I, I'm one of those that is pushing people more and more to be truly open about the mental health side of things. And especially since we've seen the documentary called uh, Being James Bond, which it's actually the name of one of our fellow community members. Uh, Joe Darlington, for example. So uh, what's 
What's and we saw Daniel Craig actually reveal he was suffering. He suffers through mm. some sort of mental health, and I would assume some sort of chronic pain now uh, because of all those injuries he's impacted over as time goes on. So let's talk about your uh, spinal injury, and let's actually uh, talk about your uh, depression, if you don't For mind. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I guess that, that'll then lead us into the uh, the podcast side of things as well. Um, yeah, so um, as I said, I uh, blew out four discs in my lumbar spine a few years ago now. Um, was working in the film industry and just, you know, compound injury, being a young kid, being eager to, you know, help everyone out on set lifting road cases incorrectly having you know 30 kilo camera sets on your shoulder you know you, you've seen in the behind the scenes of the guys carrying these huge rigs up on their shoulders um i've never carried an imax camera i know how bloody heavy those things are but um even the digital cameras um without a film roll on it those things once you add on you know, a, a follow focus, a map box, your lenses, your batteries, your remote controls, all that sort of stuff. They become incredibly heavy and working 14 hour days with something like that on your shoulder um, without looking after yourself landed me in, yeah, a, a world of hurt. Um, I was crippled for the better part of a year, I'd say, when I was uh, waiting for surgery to come along. Um, uh, we don't, um yeah we um where our our health system is quite different to over in the states where we've got the the public sector and the private sector um and i did at the time didn't have private health insurance um so if i was to go through the private sector it was going to cost me in excess of ten fifteen thousand dollars to have the surgery on my back so i decided to wait for the the private the public sector um which was free which is phenomenal you know our 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 public health system, you know, universal healthcare is yeah. phenomenal, but because it was a, um, a non-life-threatening injury, as they like to call it, um, yeah, I had to wait for about a year to get the, the surgery. So that, that really, really impacted on my mental health during that period. Um, and the recovery since then, I had the surgery 2017, I think it was, 2016. Um, it's been a, a slow recovery since then. You know, I'm still struggling with getting back into shape, um, getting my back in tip top condition. You know, I used to be very active and very fit um, playing at a, a national level of um, field hockey here. Um, now don't even play the sport because it hurts too much to run around. Um, yeah. And I, and I can speak from, uh, you know, I had a spinal fusion L5 S1. Um, I can speak from that experience. It, it's tough. And I've yeah. had, colon surgery which required me to have a colostomy i can say once you have a spinal surgery everybody i and i will say this because before i go on to my next uh spinal surgery uh talk about that well i'm not going to talk about the colon one because that's not really important but once you have one spinal surgery they tell you that it leads to multiple yep and you are never the same after I hate to say this, so heads up, everybody. I, if you are in a world of pain, and if you have back pain, don't push it away, of course. Have it looked at. Yeah. But you're never the same after it. You truly do. It does linger on. And yeah. I, I, I feel for Josh because, you know... I remember when Josh and I first met, uh, he had privately messaged me. I think it was earlier this year. And he asked me, Hey mate, if you don't mind me asking me what happened to your back. And I had told, uh, Josh what happened. And to everybody that's out there listening, I, uh, was born with a congenital spina bifida and, that lingered on from age five to 25 had my first surgery at 25 of course so i had the spinal fusion done then um was got good for about four years i got back into playing golf i got in the working on a regular basis again 
took on two jobs, which, oh my gosh, I, I was surprised I was able to do. One graveyard job and one early morning to like three in the afternoon at a golf course, which far out. Uh, don't, uh, I don't, I can tell you this. It was the graveyard shift was 10 PM to 6 AM. Oh. And I'd go over to the golf course cause it was right across the street throw on my polo for the golf course because I was working at a gym. So I was, so I would run across the street, but of course I'd shower at the gym beforehand. Okay. Wouldn't smell like work or anything like that from there. So I'd run over to the golf course. Oh my gosh. I was so tired. And then I had to work until like 3 AM. I, I will tell you this. And this is the funny, funny thing uh, I should say. I picked up the phone one day. One of my bosses called. I actually said thank you for calling the and the gym I was working with. She was like, "Wait, you know you're not uh, working." And I'm like, and "It's like, did you just come on from working <laughs> across the street?" And she did not know I was doing that for the longest time. And I said, "Yes, I did actually." And it's like, "I'm calling in a replacement for you." <laughs> and I'm like, uh, please don't do that. I want the money. And so like, I need the money. And it's like, and she was like, why? Cause, uh, you're trying to go to Vegas again. And it's like, and I said, yeah, that's, that's true. And she's like, <laughs> and it's like, all right, well, if you're not, it, by the time I come in, in about an hour, I tell you if uh, you're uh, not falling asleep at that desk, I'm sending you home. And it's like, okay. <laughs> and what happened? I was half awake and yeah, it was, it was unbelievable. She sent me home and I'm like, I'm paying you for the rest of the day. Uh, day. All right. And I said, all right, that's cool. I, I, then I'm going to jump to current day. I had a uh, spinal cord stimulator placed uh, 2000. 20, but 2009, late 2019, I was diagnosed with nerve damage in both of my legs and my lower back. That's why I say once you have multiple, one back surgery, it usually leads to multiple. And this uh, stimulator helps uh, control the nerve damage pain, but I still have severe nerve damage. So Josh, I, I send you my best and I, I hope as time gets goes on, you truly can regain strength like and i truly hope you uh can defy all the odds out of the both of us and likewise and yeah I, I really appreciate you being so open about that because it's something we don't talk about enough as young men especially is you know things that we're going through um you know obviously i i haven't had nearly the the struggle with my back that you've had i you know i'm uh, got a degenerative disc disorder. So mine sort of start crumbling at a, a faster rate than what normal people's do. And, you know, I only had a, a laminectomy. I didn't have, you know, the full fusion, um, but you know, I've been back in surgery a couple of times to have cortisone injections. Thankfully, you know, my um, fiance, she works for a, um, a spinal surgeon. She's a clinic manager. So like um, I've got the, the best of the best in terms of contacts. Um, well, Bless her that, heart as yeah. well. Like, I, yeah. uh, I, 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 and the funny thing is that's how I actually figured, well, well, I was dating someone that works at the hospital that I go to currently Yeah. for my, uh, spine where my spine surgeon is. And the funny thing is, <laughs> yeah, it's that's just, that's just funny how it is. I'm not with her anymore, of course, but you know, I, again, bless both of you, bless both of you. I hope you continue both to stay uh, healthy and safe. Thank you. And my thoughts are with you, bro. That's all I can say. Yeah. And, and I know the things. depression is tough. I, what's And like, I know you were telling me briefly about that. And I don't know if you want to dive into that. If you don't want to, we don't have to. We can just carry on. Look, I, I'm very open about mental health. As, as I said, like, as something that we don't suffer, uh, we don't talk about enough is, you know, our struggles with that. 
um you know, I've, I've had mental health issues since i was in high school um and it's you know i've been seeing psychologists and on medication for that um you know the the anxiety can be crippling at times and the the depression can get to me especially uh you know post-surgery depression is a, a very real thing and as you said um once you have spinal surgery and once you have a back injury your life changes forever it's not something that can be fixed it's you can't do the things that you used to do um and you look at yourself in a very different light you don't feel like the young fit strong guy who could you know leap over mountains and you know work those bloody 24 hour shifts because you, you can't and the the nerve damage in your leg keeps you awake at night and um so it, it all really takes a toll on you and um as much as you can do oh heck it even it makes just trying to go to the gym or work out at home difficult oh. because you're trying to summon up that that motivation absolutely and you know i i should s send you a photo after uh we get done talking here and it's actually a, me back when i was actually super energetic and a lot of people think wait sometimes i don't see this uh hyper side of jba let's i, I really <laughs> want to see it uh, if you really want to see a hype a hyper shot of me i actually have a photo of me diving into the sand that's actually on my personal facebook and it looks like i'm swimming is it photoshopped no someone took their uh, dslr camera actually snapped the shot of me actually diving into the sand and i actually have my hands looking like i'm thinning out the swim oh and i just plummeted it into the sand like at the beach like oh my gosh i still can't believe it to this very day oh that's hilarious <laughs> uh, so who have been some of your influences uh on you in this bond community you named uh david zaritsky for example and then you also yeah. named uh calvin dyson are those the main two that have been truly a uh, influence on you i i think those are the two who really got me going obviously david um i have a, a very I've never met the guy. I've never spoken to the guy outside of a comment or one of the live streams that he's had. Um, but he seemed like such a, a lovely, a really, really passionate guy who just gives back to the community. Um, and Calvin, his passion for Bond and for film in general is just inspiring. I think, um, you know, I, I've followed him for almost since he started doing what he was doing back in the day. Um, when he was a young kid and you know now he's in his 30s and doing you know incredible work um but also people like joe darlington as well i've been following him the guys at uh, james bond radio as well i've always listened to them and their podcast um and then a lot of guys who've only really started doing stuff recently you know i look to guys like yourself um you know luke taggart um you know very you know, various people who are creating their own niche within the bond community as i said james james roberts who does james bond uh, down under um you know we've only connected probably over the past year but um you know we've been able to create a, a an instagram chat called station a uh, where we've fostered uh 20, 20 aussies who we all just basically sit in there and talk shit about james bond um so it, it's it's been really cool and a really cool journey of finding inspiration from little parts here and there and everywhere and sort of figuring out what I want to do with my own thing. Well, the funny thing you brought me up and I'm, and I'm going to use me as an example. I, I love David. I love Joe. I love Calvin. Love them all. I love everybody in this community. I should say, um, I'm going to bring me up as a prime example. A lot of people don't really understand why does JBA only do interviews it dates to i love the interview style of talk show host larry king when he was alive i loved uh his youtube channel which he ended up branching out on or a tv called larry king now after he did the larry king show for several years so seeing uh you know Larry King live when, or the, I can't remember. I, yeah. Whatever he launched it on Aura TV, but it's on their, 
yeah, you can find episodes on YouTube that he mm. did. And they're like very personalized interviews. I was like, mm. you know what? I think I should do that with uh, some of the people in the community. Maybe it can branch uh, off to celebrities, which yeah. shout out to Trina Parks, uh, you know, who played Thumper. It's Went. crazy that you got that. But that you was know, phenomenal. Uh, I have, I, I have so many great memories of talking with so many great people in this community. I've yourself as of right now, uh, Joe, Calvin, David, um, the list goes on. Uh, and you know, once uh, this global uh, debriefing series keeps on kicking off, I'm hoping it will grow even more. And I can't wait to hear everybody's fascination for this beloved character that we've all came to enjoy over this uh, 60 year span. And honestly, I'm not going to make it younger people. I want to hear from the older generation as well. Like, you know, I not calling them old, David. <laughs> no, uh, I want to hear, uh, I want to hear from people like in their fifties, uh, you know, how their father, uh, like really, or their parents or whoever got them involved with this mm. franchise. I, I, it is so amazing like i said that we've had a character for 60 years and you know i'm hoping i can keep on going strong with these interviews i've it again back to there there's been some ups and then there's been some downs and you know what i think today is beginning of a trending upwards with this series definitely positivity you know, always wins mate you keep that positive mindset and I think that's one of the things that really drew me to your content, especially was the the conversations that you have with your guests. Um, you know, it's not necessarily the the stereotypical sort of who's your favorite Bond, what's your favorite Bond movie. Like everyone does that, or people can do that, but you really get to the heart of uh, people's fandom, and you get to the heart of the you know the the core reasoning behind why people love things like James Bond so much. Um, and that, that's what really drew me to your content and why I look to you for inspiration, because clearly there's a passion there for it. And uh, interviewing is such a learned skill. You know, it's something that you know, I worked corporate video for a little while and I'm, I'm okay at it, but it's definitely not something my forte. And that's why, you know, my podcast is, it's much more of a, a narration story driven style because you, you've got to have the right personality to do the interviews. And I, I take my hat off to you. Well, I, I, I honestly don't know what to say besides that truly means a lot. Actually hearing that Josh, I, I can't thank you enough. Uh, like I said, I don't know what to say. I'm at a loss of words and that doesn't happen that often. And I think the last time I was truly at a loss of words is when I interviewed David, like I, he said something very uh, moral wing and very uh, admirable. And I honestly, I, I don't forget. I try not to forget it, but sometimes I do, but just uh, what you just said, you just put me at a loss of words. So I, I truly appreciate it, mate. Uh, you're welcome. You're a humble guy. And that's, that's part of what makes you a really, really good dude. Like I know, I know you've had, problems that you came out and were very vocal about um within the community um and you're humble enough to you know state when you were wrong with different things or you know i'm not sure what happened there and i, I don't want to go into detail with it you know obviously that's that's your thing but the fact that you were able to come out and say hey yeah look i apologize for what i did um or for what i said and you know that was a really, really humble move that you did. And it just showed such a human side to you. Yeah. And I'll just say this. I appreciate that you're respecting that. Um, I'm hoping as this goes on, I, I will keep on like, I, I'm not gonna, I will keep on apologizing here and there. And like, I, I know I've potentially lost some followers and so so be it like you know on, i can't go back now but you know i apologized i i don't know if you want me to apologize to you directly i can apologize to you directly but 
you know what? I've paid my dues time after time and I've made my mistakes. Yeah. And that's I'm, and I'm kind of quoting Queen right there. Like seriously. <laughs> but you know it, it's it's true. And you've got to move forward at some point. Like you And you've that's what I'm trying to do. And you've got to look to the the positives of okay, how do I pivot, move forward and you know, keep creating stuff I'm passionate about and I yeah, that's something that, you know, I really take my hat off to you about. Well, I appreciate that very much. So thank you, Josh. Easy. Uh, how do you think you can uh, help uh, grow the uh, Australian James Bond community to uh, compare to us in the US and the UK? Well, it's funny you say that. So I think Australia, whilst we're a part of the, you know, the British Commonwealth, you know, we're ruled under the Queen a little bit like Canada, but we're probably a little bit closer to the UK than what Canada is. Um, I, I think our James Bond fandom is a lot more like the US. Um, yeah, in general, our culture is a lot more like the US. You know, we've been, we're very, very Americanized over here for good or for worse. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but we, we don't necessarily have that big fandom like they do in the UK over here. Um, you know, James Bond scene is a bit of a toffee is a bit, you know, it's, it, it's not the cool thing as such. So um, to, to have little groups like station a or the, the chat on Instagram um, where we're all able to just get in, talk about what we're passionate about um, and, you know, engaging with creators like James Bond down under and various different Aussie creators who, you know, man, I've only got 500 followers on Instagram. Yeah. I, I don't necessarily have a huge listener base on my, my podcast either, you know, but I create because I'm passionate about James Bond. I'm, cre I'm passionate about spy movies and action movies, and I'm passionate about fostering a community of like-minded people who love, uh, love, yeah, this character who's been around for 60 years. And um, hopefully once we're out of lockdown, um, you know, I, I live quite close uh within half an hour of the melbourne cbd um hoping maybe we can organize you know an imax screening of no time to die we've got you know the biggest screen in the southern hemisphere here in melbourne so maybe we can book it out with Auss aussie bond fans you know do a beers and bond cocktail event afterwards you know you know, sky's the limit but hopefully we can um, really bring together the community especially over the next few years where we're not going to necessarily have bond content to talk about. Once well, we and I'm about to say is I truly hope that all gets to happen. I, I yeah. think, uh, and uh, that's where it's going to kind of lead me into my next question. And I, and it's kind of factored into the next, uh, the, the one that we just uh, talked about. Um, what's your thoughts on George's performance as James Bond in, on Her Majesty's uh, Secret Service. And do you think the franchise would have been different if he stayed on for seven films that he was contracted to do? Do you think it would have made a more impact to, to the community if he had stayed on down there? Or what do you think? Like, as a, like I said, as a community, and then as, what do you think of his performance as well? I love George. Um, I think he made a massive mistake in leaving. Um, I think he was given really bad advice because OHMSS is in my top five Bond films. You know, yeah. His his performance, okay, it's it's a little bit wooden. It was his very first film we'd ever done, so I give him a pass for that because you know he he wasn't an actor. Um, is this the part I also say? Damn you, Ronan Riley. <laughs> <laughs> um. You know, the, the scenes where he's dubbed and he's playing Sir Hilary Bray, where he's undercover. Yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit, uh, but that's also a product of its time. You know, yeah. dubbing wasn't anything new back in the 60s and 70s. And it wasn't uh, doing... as powerful as it is today. Yeah. And like you look at characters from the early Connery films where they dubbed over Italian or Japanese actors and they were shocking. Um, so like I think George was phenomenal in the sense that he brought a real humanity to the character and I think that's part and parcel of the story that he was in as well but um I think 
Connery being bought back for one final go in Diamonds was a mistake. I don't think Connery was right for that film. I think that film would have been a lot more grounded had if they continued on the trajectory that they were taking with George. Um, I think it would have been a much better film as a result. It wouldn't have been as slapstick and comedic. Um, and I think the film franchise would have, whether he had have done one more film and gone down the Blofeld, you know, you know, killing Blofeld route or however they were going to do that out for revenge, I think we would have got a much darker franchise. I don't think necessarily Roger would have been the right fit after him. So in in some regards, I'm upset that we didn't get it. Maybe if, you know, <laughs> you're going to hate me for saying this, but if Disney had bought the rights to Bond instead of Amazon, maybe we would have got a, a what if style animated Bond <laughs> film. No, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Um, but just like result, the just like when uh, Noel Coward uh, delivered the telegraph back to them, saying "No, no, no," that's what I'm going to do to you. So, <laughs> no. Um, we got Roger as a result, and I love Roger. Um, whilst he's not my favorite Bond, I think neither without, is mine. Yeah, without George and without the flop of diamonds, um, we wouldn't have got one of the you know, best Bond films in Live and Let Die. So it's it's a it's a blessing and a curse. I I you I agree. I couldn't agree more, Josh. I think uh I I think it truly is a a shame. I, I wish he had didn't listen to Ron Riley. I wish they would have said All right. Keep on persuading him. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Come on now. And the contract he was given was great money seriously how do you pass that up and especially in the uh 70s like really like are bloody you... hippies yeah. <laughs> that's all i'm gonna say is bloody hippies <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah so then let's jump into the community side do you think if he had stayed on for the seven films it would it you think uh you know he's from quimbia right that's how you pronounce it right i'm not sure where he's from where, uh, where, where did you say quimbia i can't remember i have to uh, google that um yeah google or imdb where he's the, from i can't the remember community would have... <laughs> yeah right the community would have been very different um uh, it would have been um God, it would have been bigger in Australia, that's for sure. Um, he was from Goulburn. He was born in Goulburn, uh, okay. which is in um, New South Wales, which is the state above me. So, our most well, see, I, I'm glad I don't uh, know Australian state. culture. <laughs> um, well, Sydney's in New South Wales, so he's well. Sort of, again, uh, I still don't yeah. know where uh, Sydney is. I, all I can tell you is it's the home of the Opera House, and it's uh, famously on on uh, google images all the time yeah um oh. I, th but, I think it would have been a very different community had of george stayed on i think it would have been a very different fandom um whether it had have stayed on and been the the 25 film franchise that it has become i don't think it would have because there was so much pushback after ohmss from the fans and from you know the connery fans I don't know whether it would have been the success. Would have I been a Bond fan? I, yeah. Yeah, it's one of those what ifs, right? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe Cheers it's one Disney. of those things you, you're going to have. No, <laughs> no we're not going to talk about Disney. If I'm going to talk about Disney, we're talking about Mary Poppins. But um, I can dig it. I can dig it. Uh, But I'm going to say maybe you should uh, do a little uh, what if uh, series for your podcast. I reckon that'd be cool. I mean, I, I'm thinking of doing an episode once once i release so as i said my own my podcast not just mm -hmm. about james bond i'm doing i'm releasing this weekend the uh, fast and the furious episode that i've been working on for a while um the long I'm delayed one that uh, made one. you uh have a computer crash unfortunately 
made me had a brain crash. <laughs> oh. Well, um, I know I have those from time to time as well. Absolutely. I want to do an OHMSS one because I think the uh, campaign around that and uh, bringing in a new bond for the first time is something that could be really cool to discuss. Absolutely. And especially when yeah. he was discovered from Big Fried Chocolates. Crazy. Crazy. Oh, <laughs> um, so... Josh, I want to thank you uh, for taking this time uh, and representing uh, Australia in the uh, Global Debriefing uh, Series. Any final words before we sign off? Keep the secrets. Don't spoil No Time to Die for us because, yeah, we've still got a little while to go. I hope you enjoy the film when you get to see it. I think uh, it's going to be one hell of a swan song for Daniel Craig and... I just can't thank you enough for having me on, Brian, um, and for your friendship and the, the passion that you show for James Bond. So, um, yeah, I, I look forward to discussing the film with you once I see it in November. And, you know, hopefully we can uh, do a, a debriefing, debriefing <laughs> afterwards. And we may actually truly have to. I, I think it's going to be uh, only logical. So, so uh, where can we actually Absolutely. find Selling Secrets? I only uh, know of apple as we speak yep so i'm on uh instagram at selling secrets pod um pretty much you can find me wherever you get your podcasts from spotify apple amazon google you name it stitcher i think we're on stitcher as well so um yeah if you want to download it just search for selling secrets podcast um and yeah i hope people enjoy listening to me talking about uh marketing it's it's not necessarily an exciting topic but it's um something i'm passionate about and i hope i bring a bit of sexiness and exciting times to it <laughs> fantastic josh well make sure you guys go uh listen to josh at selling secrets podcast and follow him at 007 oz which is w7 aus at instagram uh links will be also down under like i said earlier in this video Please give this video a like and subscribe and hit that bell for uh, more episodes coming soon. And the next country will also be announced on the Facebook and Instagram at James Bond Aficionado. Once again, Josh, thank you very much for taking the time, brother. Brian, thank you for having me.